Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the evening webinar. <clears throat> um, I'm Jesse Cardinal. Um, um, uh, I'll just introduce myself the way I always do. Tanse Jesse Cardinal Natsiga Sun Kikano Tsunia. Um, <clears throat> Atoskian, Keepers of the Water. I'm Jesse Cardinal. I am from the community of Kikino. It's located in Treaty 6 territory on the border of Treaty 8 territory. And I'm currently serving as the Executive Director for Keepers of the Water. Um, so Keepers of the Water, we partnered with Environmental Defense to host this webinar. Uh, which is called Water Knows No Boundaries. And it's uh, about releasing of the toxic tailings ponds. <clears throat> so the title is uh, Water Knows No Boundaries, Releasing Toxic Tailings Ponds Won't Either. And uh, so we're both hosting this webinar together. Again, we're really happy to have you all join us on your, I think it's Tuesday evening. I think it's Tuesday today. Um, and so I'm just gonna get going um, with our with our evening here. So I just wanted to do a quick rundown of what to expect um, with our hour and a half together with each other here. Um, so I'm gonna be doing a little bit of an introduction to the webinar and a little bit of housekeeping. And then we're gonna get right into our presentations. Uh, we have a presentation by Eleanor, um, who's with Environmental Defense, and she's going to be presenting some of the really important and uh, um, meaningful work that Environmental Defense has been doing around the tar sands and tailings issues. And then we'll, um, we're hoping Jean Lomcourt can join us. We're still trying to patch her in on this webinar. She's a community member from Fort Mackay. She lives directly, uh, you know, in the, in the Treaty 8 area where the tar sands are situated. And, and, um, then we have Denny and also a lawyer, and he'll be talking about the giving us some of the legal context and legal issues um, by some of the current concerns and issues that we're seeing with the tar sands and the tailings ponds today. And then we're going to give you all a chance to ask questions. So as you're going along and you're hearing the presentations, um, we would just ask you if you have a question to hang on to that and uh, just hold, hold it for later and we'll, we'll give you time for So that was a big breathful. Um, <clears throat> we wanna slow down for a minute and take time. We, we planned this webinar to be on this day. Um, there was a couple of dates we could have picked well, we pick this day we try and pick significant days because our work is is tied into so many things as an indigenous led organization it's tied into so many things so first i'll tell you about keepers of the water so you may not know who we are um we're an indigenous led organization and our main mission is to protect water and so we were formed in 2006 out of um you know, uh, Indigenous people coming together, the Dene people in the north and the allies, and, and we were seeing some drastic changes to the water. And uh, people got together at that time and formed Keepers of the Water. And in summary, there, like, there was a declaration made at that time in 2006. And in summary, what that declaration states is that water is sacred and that we must work to protect it. And so throughout all of our journey as an organization, we've been involved in, you know, addressing the tar sands and coal mining and a lot of other issues. It all comes back to water. And so that's, um, you know, if we ever kind of wonder, like, are we on the right track? We always go back to um, that declaration and just remember that we are here to protect water. And so that's who, a bit of who we are. We have... Um, we have a board, we have staff, we're a growing organization. We've done a lot. Just check out our website and you'll get an idea of who we are. 
we're governed by co-chairs. We have three women that, uh, you know, the uh, Okamaos, Okamaos Squeal, our boss ladies, and those that Sue Duranje, Jean Lomcourt, and Cleo Reese, and they help guide us along with the other women on our board. We have some really amazing women like Josie Oje and Diane Giroux, and they keep us grounded as an organization to make sure, um, you know, that we are walking, um, in the best way possible in this work because it's it's sacred work for us um so you know we we do things a little bit differently and we we're very proud of that and we we nurture that and we honor that and um so that's a little bit about keepers of the water and when ali goes to do her presentation i'll let her introduce um environmental defense because i think she'll be able to do that better which will be right away Going back to why we had the event on this day. So this is a significant day as some of you may or may not know. Today is the, um, I'll give you the official title. It's the National Day of Action for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls, and there's a TSLGBTQQIA plus people. So that includes a whole lot of people. And just, um, I just want to spend five minutes talking about that. Uh, <clears throat> you know, traditionally Indigenous people, and this is, these are things we're learning as we decolonize and we go back to our ways and we're learning about, you know, the ceremonies and the way that Indigenous people, we uh, the way our people used to live and govern themselves. And we're learning a lot that they were there was a lot of matriarchal systems, which means the women used to run the community. So it was like the elder women, um, you know. So if decisions were going to be made, it was um, we checked in with the women, and the women would make the decisions, and they would tell, you know, the warriors, or they would tell the men, you know what to do and they, we delivered the babies we picked the medicines we took care of the, the community so that's how we were run as indigenous communities and it was through colonization the the, the our systems were severely fractured and 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 impacted because when the colonists came over, they were used to went back then back where they came from women didn't have a voice. And so they brought the, that way of thinking to this land. And so they would only talk to the women. Um, and uh, I'm just trying to change my screen here so I can see things better. <clears throat> and so when that colonization was happening and you know the, the Europeans were coming to the land, they didn't want to talk to the women because that's not how they did things back home. Women were not looked at. Um, you know, to have a voice. And so through like the creation of the Indian Act and all of these policies, they they eroded all of the rights of women. Um, and like women weren't even allowed to vote. That's how they formed this colonial government structure. So even non-Indigenous women were allowed to vote because that just showed you how the women were treated. That has trickled through to, to, to today that um, uh, disrespect, that disregard, the violence towards women. And that's where it started. And, and sometimes it's hard for people to hear that because it's like, well, that's not me. That's not how I do it. But you know, it's somewhere down those lines that um, women were uh, you know, just seen as nothing. Uh, I'll just give you one quick example. So on the when the for the reserve system was being made, the indigenous people were being herded, the First Nations people were being herded onto these small plots of land. And if an, if, and as uh, First Nation women started marrying, if they married a white man, they lost any status, any privileges as an indigenous person. They basically became nobody and nothing. If a white woman married a native man, she was given status. So as First Nation women would marry a non-Indigenous men, let's just say it, First Nation women would marry white men, they would lose their treaty status, they would lose any kind of rights that they had that were given at the time to be Indigenous. But if white women came and married Indigenous men, they were given 
treaty status. And so you can see how things are really, um, really confusing. And so it was a lot of Indigenous women that started fighting to get these rights back. And I think it was in the 1985 where they reinstated where it was like these women that lost their status could reapply for their status and they became Bill C-31. So they still didn't even truly become um, recognized and we're still fighting today to become recognized. And so through that, through those um, colonial systems, it was put in the minds of people that it's okay to disrespect Indigenous women, that we were nothing, you know? And so we're seeing that. We see that a lot in the industrial camps. They call, they're called man camps. Like, um, I could go on and on and on about that day, but I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of context of, you know, um, what it's like to be an Indigenous woman, and especially people like uh, pe women of color, they even have a harder time. And this day is set aside to talk about it, to remember it, and what are we going to do about it? Because we can't be setting aside holidays just to say, well, we're going to, you know, we're going to pray about it, or we're going to talk about it, or think about it. And I challenge you all, what are we going to do to make it better for women and especially Indigenous women on these lands to feel safe and to feel loved and to feel included. So that's that, that's that spiel. So we're here in, in honor of the women that have gone on, you know, that have been murdered, that are missing still, and, and we, we think of them at this time. So back to our webinar. Um, let me get back to my script because I'm, I'm getting a little bit off script here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, introduce Ali, um, who's, our, who's the program manager, uh, program climate and energy, program manager, this is a long title, Ali, program manager, climate and energy and environmental defense. Um, before I do that, I just want to do one very quick housekeeping. As you guys have questions, just remember to put them in the Q&A, not in the chat, because we won't get them if they go in the chat. So as you guys are putting your questions in, we'll be taking track of them, and um, then we'll answer them at the end of the webinar. So um, I will just kind of center ourselves. I would invite you all to center yourselves and think of the water, think of the land, think of the animals, because this is why we do the work that we do. You know, we're here to protect the water. We're here to protect the trees. We think of the animals at this time. We think of the plants. We think of the medicines. So I just welcome you all to center yourselves in that. And remember that as we're sharing this information, and as you guys are participating, you're here for a reason as well, is that, you know, we're, we're not only doing this for ourselves as humans, there's, a, we, we coexist with, with everything, you know, um, so I just, I want to keep that in mind as we move forward in this evening. And so Ali, I will get you to introduce yourself and environmental defense, and then we'll just get going with your part of the presentation. That sounds good. Thanks so much, Jesse. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Bonsoir. Um, so my name is Aliénor Rougeau, or Ali, if it's easier. I go by she, her pronouns. Um, and as Jesse mentioned, I'm with Environmental Defense. Um, and before I, I tell you a bit more about our work, just really wanted to thank Jesse for, first of all, for accepting the host and for doing it so well, and also for sharing um, all this education with us. We really don't take it for granted when you take the time to, to educate us um, and to bring us along on, on all of your learning journey. So thanks, thanks again for that. Um, folks, if you're joining an environmental defense webinar for the first time, uh, welcome. Um, environmental defense works, uh, as you can see on the screen, to defend clean water, safe climate, and healthy communities. And today we're really talking about all these these things as we talk about our oil sands tailings campaign. Um, I'm going to apologize right away for the background that I have. It's not my aesthetic choice, but I've been traveling for work. And so that's the explanation of the hotel room. Uh, my apologies for that. So um, 
Pa, who is helping us on the back end, if you're able to go to the slides, the presentation, please. Excellent, thank you. So I'm here today to present to you our uh, report, 50 Years of Sprawling Tailings, which came out earlier this year. Um, that's some of the work we do uh, on oil sands tailing spawns. We also have the chance to collaborate very closely with keepers on a whole range of, of issues, which we'll talk about after. Um, this report was, was co-written between uh, myself and uh, Jillian, who is with CPAWS, uh, the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, uh, their Northern Alberta chapter. Um, and so she was able to bring a lot of her conservation background and her North of Alberta uh, background uh, to this work. Um, this report was really there to serve three purposes. First of all, we knew that there was an information gap about what's really happening in the oil sands and uh, related to the tailings ponds. And so we wanted to make new information public and available. Uh, we also wanted it to be a tool so that communities and so that all of you were able to um, check and counter the oil industry's false claims about their responsible production, their responsible management. So we wanted you to be equipped with that um, and the report served that purpose. And then we really wanted to um, center Indigenous knowledge and um, experiences in the way we interpret the information of the report. So the analysis we did, we then had conversations with folks um, that, that we'll talk about after um, to really interpret this in a way that's different from perhaps how um, environmental groups have done it in the past. So you can see the cover of the report here. Um, it was based on a series of maps and um, I will go into that uh, right now. Um, let's talk about what are tailing spawns, just in case you're not quite sure as you're joining this. Um, tailings ponds is really not a good name for the immense lakes of toxic waste that the oil industry has created in order to store their toxic waste. Um, I don't know if you know this, but producing oil from the Alberta tar sand is not a smooth process where you just put something in and then there's just beautiful oil coming out, not at all. Quite the opposite, it demands a lot of chemicals and it demands a lot of water. So for one barrel of oil produced, it takes three to four, sometimes five barrels of water. Um, and then all that water becomes toxic waste, which has to be stored somewhere in these open air pits that you are seeing here. The tailings are super toxic because, you know, as uh, the oil production process happens, um, you have the residue, the rest of the bitumen that stays in the tailings ponds, and you also have the chemicals that they add to extract bitumen. So you can just understand that there's um, a, a ton of different things in there. Um, some of the substances, you might recognize the names because we know that they're very toxic in other um, parts of our, our life, such as benzene or mercury. And then there's names that you might have never heard before, like nephthenic acids, which are very toxic to wildlife and to people. Um, tailings are you know, one of the reasons that oil production is so destructive because it's a wasteful production technique. Um, just to give you a few elements as to why tailings are so harmful, they've been proven to leak uh, billions of liters of toxic fluids into the groundwater. Because as you can see on our, uh, on our little drawing, they're not meant to be perfectly permeable. They, they allow for toxic fluids to leak. Um, they also evaporate a lot of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Um, and they also create a lot of loss of habitat uh, because of how much land they take on over the years. So let's go to our next slide, which is really uh, kind of the, the, the result of our analysis. We mapped out since 1975, to 2020 in five-year increments. So here you have a bit of an extract of that, the growth of the tailings. And so you can see at the very beginning, you can barely see them on your screen. And then we basically you know, highlighted them over the maps for you to see how much they've grown. And you can really see um, that it's been an ex exponential growth in such a short period of time. Um, if we're gonna go to the next slide, we will talk about what this mapping has taught us because our goal was not just to map them, uh, show them on a map and then kind of move on. 
we really wanted to, to have numbers on what that represented because again, this information was not public. We did not know how much land they're taking up. So the numbers you can see here basically tell you that just the pond part, the tailing pond already takes up um, about 240 times the size of the Edmonton Mall, uh, which is the largest mall in Canada. Um, but I wanna put that statistic aside for a moment and tell you that tailings aren't just harmful because they because of the fluid part. Tailings actually cover a lot more land because they have a lot of other infrastructure. And so we wanted to calculate how much do they take over in total? How much habitat do they destroy in total? And we found that that's 300 square kilometers. That's 2.6 times the size of Vancouver. That's three times the size of Paris. Um, so you have this enormous amount of waste that's taking on more enormous chunks of um, the territories. And then you realize that that's not the whole story because what we were able to see when we mapped out is not only how big they are now, but how much they've grown. And since 2000s, they grew 300%. So while we're hearing more and more industries talk about responsible management and sustainability, what our maps showed us is that their tailings waste has grown 300%. Now on the final note about kind of our shocking findings with this report, um, and I know these are a lot of numbers, um, but you, you have them clearly on the slides here. We wanted to check how much of this destruction has currently been cleaned up because the industry often puts out messaging about how they're already cleaning up and they're reclaiming the land. And when we looked, we made the calculation that only 0.1% of the area has actually been certified reclaimed, 0.1%. So what this taught my co-author Jillian and I is that Canada's oil production is not only a problem because of its contribution to climate change and all these other things, it's really the home of environmental racism in the sense that these tailing spawns are leaking and evaporating and taking over lands that are the territories of First Nation and Métis people. So if we can go to the next slide, I'll, I'll, I told you before that we didn't just wanna map things out and move on. We wanted to actually understand what the harm was. And this is where, thanks to Keepers, thanks to Jesse, uh, we were able to connect with Jean Lomcourt and with Mike Mercury who both uh, live in different communities downstream. Um, and they were able to share basically how they've seen in um, their um, use of the land in their everyday lives. Um, and thanks to their traditional knowledge, how they've been able to, to, to you know, see and interpret these maps. I'm not gonna be telling you what they told me. This is their stories to share. And I encourage you um, to look through the report to actually have their direct words. Um, I'm going to tell you the three lessons I learned from them, um, from my own words. Um, I learned from them that language really, really matters, and that industry and government is particularly good at using language to minimize the, the problem. They use language like ponds to hide the fact that they're immense lakes. Uh, but Jean was also telling me, you know, they use language like industrial projects when it really is about the destruction and the disruption of place. It's not just projects. Um, they use language like reclamation, but Jean said that, you know, for her reclamation is when it ends when herself as an indigenous woman has access to the land again. So really telling me that we need to pay close attention to those uh, elements of language because they're often used uh, to, to make it seem like the problem is less of a problem. Um, the second lesson I really learned from them is that uh, the harm that's done by the tailings is, uh, we can really qualify it as environmental racism because it affects the fundamental practices, fundamental parts uh, of, of life for Jean and Mike. They, ta they talked about how it impacted, how they're able to fish and do teachings on the land and all these other things that I encourage you to actually read through in their own words in the report. Um, and hopefully if, if Jean is able to join us later on, um, she'll be able to speak to it uh, herself. 
And then they, they taught me this third thing, which is um, something that all of you probably have heard before, but sometimes it's really important for us to, to let it register, is that nature doesn't work in silos. Nature doesn't work in a project per project situation. And so while industry will do its best to try to um, convince us that they're just responsible for one of the ponds or two of the ponds, well, the people that are facing the consequences have to deal with all of them. And so this was a really important learning in, in the way that we can't just look at it from a one project per project, but look at it in the sense of all the impacts at once, what we call cumulative impacts. Um, so these were the direct learnings that we had in the report. So what you just heard from me is the direct result of our maps, which show how much the ponds have grown, how much space they're now taking over, and how little has actually been cleaned up. And then you've heard what kind of harm that's actually doing to communities. Um, I'll now go to the next slide, please, to let you know um, about this reclamation aspect. So as I said earlier, industry is trying to say that they're cleaning up their mess, they're being responsible about things. What we saw in the mapping is that no tailing pond has been certified and that only 0.1% of all the area disturbed by the industry has been reclaimed. So we're really at a point where there's close to no progress and that's an important thing to remember. The second one, um, next slide please, um, is that the, both the volume and the tailings of the tailings and the area continues to grow. So again, when you're hearing industry saying we're managing it, the facts are there. The waste is continuing to grow. The problem continues to grow. And then the third one is um, that although industry is talking about some numbers like 50 million are invested on reclamation research, when you compare it to the profits they're making, um, this is really close to nothing. I mean, um, 50 million is 3,000 times less than what they made um, this, this year alone. So really trying to keep in mind that um, the efforts are not there when it comes to actually cleaning up this mess. Um, I'll go to the next slide to tell you that one of our goals with writing this report was having clear recommendations for the government about what can be done. Um, we had seven recommendations, and I don't think you all want to hear about all of them, but there's two that stand out to me as an important basis for the conversation we're having today. The first one is, don't create a larger problem than what we already have. Since industry clearly is showing that they're not responsibly managing this current waste, we cannot create new tailing spawns, we cannot create new oil mans. If we can't fix the problem, don't make it bigger. And so that was our first recommendation um, against any new project um, until the situation is, is figured out. Um, and both the federal and the provincial government have a way to address this. The second one is that solutions for cleanup have to be agreed upon by the indigenous nations affected and have to be actually good for the environment. And so this is where we get in the topic of today. Jesse mentioned earlier briefly that we're gonna talk about the issue of release because industry is now pushing for this uh, new method where they would like to release water or fluids from the tailings into the Athabasca River. They say they're gonna treat it and we can talk about um, why, why that's uh, unproven afterwards. Um, but I wanna stress really carefully that it, um, the cleanup method that needs to be chosen to clean up this waste has to be one that is environmentally safe and that is agreed upon by the nations that are impacted by this. So these were really our recommendations that we had here. Now, um, if we just want to go um, briefly to what you can do about all of this, um, we wanted to make this report helpful for you. We wanted to make it um, a tool that you can use in your everyday life to have conversations about um, environmental racism, to have conversation about oil production and the harm that oil production is doing. And so to make this report your own, we have a landing page, which is much easier than all of the report. It just has a few of the big statistics so you can remember them, you can bring them up in conversation, you can tweet them out. Then we have all the maps and you have this little fun tool where you can just scroll 
throughout the year. So you can kind of see the evolution. And then my favorite part of the whole report, we actually took um, the cutouts of all the tailings and we put them over some of the big cities that you know and love across Canada, but over Vancouver, over Edmonton, over Montreal and over Toronto. And you can see how much of the cities they would take. And you can actually download those. So I'd encourage you, I challenge you, put that on your Facebook, put it on our social media, start a conversation with those about what oil production means in Canada, because those maps really show um, what's actually happening on the ground. And with that, I'll leave it at that for now, pass it back to Jesse, um, and then hopefully we can chat a little more later on if you're interested. Thanks, Ali. That was, um, I really enjoyed listening to that. I could listen to that a lot longer because you speak so well and explain the issues so well. Uh, just a little bit more context. Uh, I'm not sure where the audience is at for understanding about the tar sands, as we call it. Some people call it the, the oil sands um, or the tailings ponds. So the tar sands are located in Northeast, um, what's colonially known as Alberta and Treaty 8 territory. It is the biggest industrial project on the planet. And we've even found the references to back that up so we can provide those for you um, either this evening or tomorrow to reach out to you. Um, it's massive. And the reason why we call it the tar sands is because they're not extracting oil, they're extracting bitumen. And it's, um, what do you call it? It was the conventional oil was what it was called to begin with. Cause back in the fifties, they, they, you know, discovered this oil, but indigenous people knew that this, this tar substance was here and they used it for the how they needed it, but it was living in harmony with the land. So it was never um, seen as something that needed to be massively extracted out to, um, you know, uh, help sustain this existence that we have, which isn't even sustainable anyway. And so Indigenous people knew about this and we, and you know, the people up there, um, we used it for the purposes that we needed it for. And then in the 50s, with the, the evolution of science and, and all of these things, um, you know, they, dis they discovered that they can extract this bitumen. Back then, it was easy to dis extract because it was on the surface. So they used th this technology that was created. And the thing is, is they're still using a lot of that old technology today. That's one concern is that the technology is their extraction technology is still like it's it's outdated. And our science guy says it's like a T model Ford or something. And we should be on like smart cars. Um, and so that was called conventional oil. That's all gone. So what they're 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 extracting right now are conventional bitumen. They is unconventional because it's all of the stuff that was easy to get out. That's all gone. So whatever they're digging deeper and deeper um, through uh, steam assisted gravity. Like they have other technologies that they're using in combination with the really old technology. And they're just massively extracting um, and it's getting harder and harder and deeper and deeper. And the cumulative impacts are just massive. So this is in the boreal forest. There's a few concerns with that. Well, there's a lot of concerns with that, but the boreal forest is the lungs. So they say like the boreal forest and the Amazon forest, those are the lungs of the planet. They keep the planet alive. We need to have a healthy boreal forest for so many reasons, but one of the main reasons is that it absorbs carbon, you know, and we have, it's just such diverse ecosystems in the boreal forest, and the boreal forest retains water. It's just, um, you know, you may not understand. So if people are living in a city, are they far removed, maybe even on the other side of the world, like why should I care what happens in Northern Alberta and the boreal forest? It affects you because if we have a healthy boreal forest in, in what's called Northern Alberta in Canada, the other side of the world is going to be healthy. And so that's part of, um, so, so we call it 
um, the tar sands because it's bitumen. So they're, they're extracting this really heavy substance that they have to ship away. And then that gets processed um, to become oil. And, um, and uh, so with that, and I just want to speak really quickly, because I know that we I only have like a minute that I'm going to pass it to Daniel is the cumulative impacts. So I want to talk about that really quickly. So they have massive deforestation. So it's not only extracting of bitumen, it's creating all these roads, clear cutting forests, they're draining wetlands, wetlands, again, help retain water, they help clean the planet, they help um, uh, capture carbon, carbon emissions. And once wetlands are destroyed, that's it, you cannot recreate wetlands. There are science studies, they've been trying to, um, you know, recreate wetlands, and they haven't been able to. Um, and at the animals and the plants, you know, and I always think of the animals because they, they, they know their roots, right? So it's like when you come home, it's like you go to work and you know your root and then you come home and then you like eat and that's your safe place. That's where you relax. It's the same thing with animals. You know, they have roots that they follow. So it's like uh, the beaver, the deer, you know, the muskrat, they all have their places that they go. And so just, and I, and I just, think sometimes because when you drive up, up up in these in our communities and you see this clear cutting happen and you just imagine like these living beings and they you know they go for a little while and then they come home and it's gone you know what they might what they must feel like and what that must be like for them and you know and especially like the ones with the babies in springtime like all of these all springtime is uh it's it's, a, it's our new year as indigenous people and that's when all the life is happening so imagine all of the living beings with all their babies like the ducks the geese the bears everybody has babies and they're out on the land you know and and these are the kinds of things, the things that we think about it, you know, and we're trying to have people understand that these are major issues, but there's like a whole other world out there other than us. And so with the tailings, what I want to get back to what Ali mentioned. So these are poisonous. Um, they can be seen from outer space. They're massive. Anything that lands on them will die. We, we have had tar sands healing walks. If you Google tar sands healing walk, you'll find, um, you know, the stories about the healing walks. We actually go, we do a loop around the tar sands because sometimes if you don't see it, you can't really understand how destructive this is to the land. And we do this 14 kilometer walk around the tar sands. And you can see uh, things that places that look like desert, you can hear gunshots. And uh, the gunshots are mimicking, they're not real gunshots, but they sound like gunshots. And it's meant to try keep the wildlife away from these tailings ponds, because if anything ingests it, like they're gonna die. Um, you see all of this um, pollution, like the, these emissions coming out. And there is a First Nation community smack dab called Fort Mackay around all of these industrial plants. It's, uh, it's really surreal when you drive up to Fort Mackay. And this is what the kids are growing up with. This is what is, that's when Ali talks about environmental racism. That's a uh, perfect example of environmental racism. Imagine a little eight-year-old girl or boy and they're driving every day and they're driving through that. That's their backyard. It's, it's really disturbing and it's sickening. And so with these tailings ponds, the Alberta government and the industry, they want to start dumping them into the Athabasca River. And they're saying, we found a way to treat them and it's just like water and we're going to start dumping them. And when we found that out in 2019, as keepers of the water, we're like, what? This is insane, you know? And we have a hard stance. We, there is no dumping of any tailings into the Athabasca River. And so what we're saying is if you can treat this, these tailings to be like water, then you take that and you keep reusing it and reusing it because they say that they recycle and that they have these great recycling systems. So they already have the recycling systems in place in their extraction process. So they don't need to, you know, and I always say it will become uh, from one of the most destructive projects on the planet to one of the most efficient because they, they'll, they won't be using any fresh water. They use 
Um, I think it's like six barrels of fresh water to extract one barrel of bitumen. So they're taking massive, massive amounts. That's another thing when we talk about cumulative impacts and I'll wrap it up right, like right quick. They use a lot of fresh water. And so they won't have to take any water and they won't have to dump any poison in the water. So we're really calling them out to say, we want to see your science because there's been no independent science to, to show us that what you're even saying is actually true. And, um, and there's a lot of legal implications. And that's where Daniel comes in. So Daniel Ticelli, um, I'll uh, introduce you, but he, he's he been working with Keepers of the Water. He's uh, Denny, he hunts moose, he's a non-practicing lawyer, he's on the land and he's just, um, he's been an amazing part of our team because, you know, he also knows indigenous law and that's where we're going as indigenous people. It's like, get us out of these um, corrupt, oppressive colonial legal systems and let us govern the land the way we're, we're intended to. So I'll pass it over to Daniel to continue this conversation about why, it, um, you know, the tailings are harmful and why dumping of the tailings will be um, what I'm calling um, uh, international human rights crime. So welcome, Daniel, and I'll let you um, <clears throat> add anything to your introduction that you'd like. And thank you for staying with us this evening to all of the viewers. Thanks, Jesse. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Daniel Teselli. I'm Dene from Fort Good Hope, which is a small isolated community just south of the Arctic Circle. Uh, on the banks of the big river, they call it the Mackenzie River on the map. And so tailings is an issue for us because we are downstream from the tailings ponds. We're very far downstream, but we still have to worry about the cumulative effects of any tailings leak or release, along with the, the myriad other contaminant sources that make make their way into the water here which we do drink this is the water source for the community and it's kind of a main highway for Dene up here because travel is so difficult with a very short winter road season i i want to i am a retired lawyer i used to be a lawyer i don't like doing that uh, now i do other things that i enjoy like working on indigenous rights and environmental justice but I, I want to zero in on uh, the issue that that we've been raising and that has really gotten a lot of attention from Dene this far downstream. Uh, and that is this issue of the proposed release of what they're calling treated tailings uh, via regulations under Canada's Fisheries Act. So Canada has a Fisheries Act, and that's the federal government of Canada, and that prohibits the dumping of what they call deleterious substances into any fish bearing water and that means any substance that could be poisonous to fish so it includes tailings it is illegal to put that into any fish bearing water unless there is specific authorization to do so via regulations under that federal fisheries act so because most uh uh things that are related to these massive industrial activities are under the jurisdiction legally of provinces there's been very little that people who do not have leverage with the provincial government of alberta can do to to uh, impact the kind of uh, trajectory of these tailings ponds and all of the related infrastructure and destruction of the boreal forest the Fisheries Act is one of those areas where people everywhere who have some leverage with Canada's federal government are allegedly supposed to have a voice that can somehow protect this massive, pristine and fragile watershed and ecosystem that empties into the Arctic Ocean. And the proposal on the table from Canada's federal government now is to effectively remove that protection and introduce these regulations that would allow for the release of these treated tailings into the Athabasca River. Um, I'm not sure if it was mentioned, but these treated tailings uh, are still high in naphthenic acids and in salinity. So although they're treated, they are still toxic. Uh, and it is an issue for downstream communities and for the ecosystems. 
So this has gained some attention uh, up here further north. And in July of this year, the Dene Nation, which is a political organization representing Dene and advocating on the rights for Dene, at the Dene Nation Assembly in July, uh, the chiefs passed a resolution that outright opposes the uh, introduction of these Fisheries Act regula regulations um, and also calls on Canada to undertake a process to seek the free prior and informed consent of downstream Dene uh, as a requirement, as a legal requirement before they introduce these regulations. And I want to talk about that very briefly because I think that's something that's a perspective that is shifting, and I think we're going to see that be more prevalent in the discussion about these proposed Fisheries Act changes. Uh, we're dealing with uh, a colonial legal system that, that is really premised on, on values and doctrines that are centuries old um, and that are, are effectively outdated now. And the direction that international law is moving when it comes to the rights of Indigenous people is that international law is starting to recognize Indigenous people's rights to self-determination, to autonomy or self-government, uh, to recognition and preservation of cultural identity, uh, rights to traditional land and natural resources, and that includes restitution for lands that have been lost or stolen. Uh, rights to reparation and redress for wrongs that have been suffered at the hands of colonial governments and nations, and the rights to have treaties and agreements that were fairly negotiated uh, be upheld and honored by the state. So this is the direction that international law is moving in, and a common thread that kind of weaves through a lot of these uh, distinct rights that Indigenous peoples uh, have under international law is free prior and informed consent. And what that means is that when government, when the state is proposing some type of action or activity that would have significant impacts on the rights of Indigenous peoples, then the state needs to undertake a process to get the consent of those indigenous peoples before it can move ahead. And this process, uh, uh, in this process, the consent needs to be free in the sense that it's not coerced uh, and that there's no, no bullying or issues of duress involved in gaining that consent. The consent needs to be prior in the sense that it is given before the state actually moves ahead with the action so that the consent is actually meaningful and not just a box that they're ch they're checking. Uh, and the consent needs to be informed. And that means that Indigenous people need to have access to all of the information that's needed to understand the issue and make a decision. And they also need to have the time and resources available to them to go through that information in order to, to make that decision. Uh, and in cases where the potential for an impact to rights is severe, then the way international law is moving is that consent is a requirement. It is not just a process. If the state, if the government does not obtain the consent of impacted Indigenous people, they cannot proceed with the proposed activity. Um, and again, this is new evolutions in international law um, and uh, Canada's uh, legal system, uh, things like Section 35 and the jurisprudence that has kind of been developed under that are not recognizing this yet. And I think we're going to see this discussion start coming more to the forefront on issues uh, like this, this tailings release issue and the proposed regulations under the Fisheries Act. And that is the direction that that Dene up here uh, are starting to take when we're pushing back on Canada's federal government with this proposal. Uh, so I will leave it at that so we have time for questions and answers. Uh, thank you, Masi. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Dene Nation is massive. It's, um, I don't know how many <clears throat> um, 
nation communities there are up there. Sorry, I just have to have a sip of tea here. But um, every year they have a gathering. It's called the National, the Dene National Assembly, and all of these Dene Nation communities get together in Northwest Territories once a year to talk about issues. They agree on things. They, they, they. That's part of their governance structure, and they pass these resolutions where they all agree, um, these Dene nations are all agreeing that this is an uh, issue of importance. And so what Daniel said was in July this year, they had their Dene national gathering where all of the Dene nation, uh, nations came together. And one of the things that they, a resolution that they passed was that they are opposed to <clears throat> any dumping of the tailings ponds into the Athabasca River and that they want to be consulted. So the federal government is starting to say, well, we're, we're consulting the nations, but only as far as um, the Alberta border. And, they, and then they're handpicking some nations north of the Alberta border that they're going to consult. But the Dene Nation is saying, we want to be properly consulted, um, you know, free prior and informed consent. And so that's where that's at. Um, so I, I, uh, we have a lot of questions coming in and I think that will help us carry through some good, um, discussion. So Ali is going to take over moderating the questions, Daniel and I, and, and Ali will try and answer as best as we can, um, for any questions that you guys have. So thank you. That sounds great. And thanks to, to the both of you for your presentations. Yeah, and thank you folks for asking all your questions. Some of them are very thoughtful. It sounds like you, you uh, know some of this information already and want to dig deeper. There's a question that I know both of you can uh, have great answers to. There's a question of, are there any health concerns for the surrounding communities that have already come to light? So what's the health care assessment situation in the area right now? That's a really good question. I'll go first. So um, we have a medical doctor who sits on our board, Dr. John O'Connor, who some of you may have heard of. He actually won a whistleblower award through the Ryerson University. And back in about 2005, 2006, because he was a doctor working in the community of Fort Chippewan. And so the tar sands are here and the water flows downstream pass right into their community and and along the way it, it um, deposits into Lake Athabasca and Lake Slave, uh, Slave less Great Slave Lake and then it keeps on going into the Arctic Ocean. So while he was a medical doctor there he was starting to see a lot of rare cancers, um, bile duct cancer. It's, it's a really rare cancer and he was starting to see many cases of it in the community and all kinds of other ailments like skin rashes and, and um, just the medical um, issues were adding up in this community of Fort Chippewan. And so he was saying like, and he was going to Alberta Health and he was going to federal health and saying like, this is happening, you know, what can be done about it? We would like to have a, maybe an independent study, but something is happening here. Like this is not normal. And instead they, they didn't want this to get out there. So what they did was they worked with the community to get them fired and, um, he is still today to this day asking for an independent health study to be done. Um, he has been hired back into the communities and because he they they know the community people know that he was right. It wasn't the community people he was helping, but it was just through politics and industry that I think tried to push him out. We also have um, there was some other studies done. Dr. Kevin e. Dr. Kevin Timoney did a study. He partnered with uh, Mikasu and ACFN on that. And what that study was, they were testing the animals and um, the health of the animals and the health of the water. And what they were finding through that study, and we have links to these studies, is that the Athabasca River flows north and then there's Lake Athabasca and that's where Fort Chippewan is located off of. So that's where they do a lot of their hunting and fishing off of Lake Athabasca. 
And through that study, he was finding that there was higher deposits of mercury and arsenic. So it doesn't just flow smoothly and dump out into the Arctic Ocean, you know, as you have lakes and uh, ponds that these deposits of chemicals, um, these chemicals deposit there. So there was that study. Then there was the Schindler study. Um, late Dr. Schindler, and you guys may have heard of that study where him and Dr. Aaron Kelly, who now works for the Northwest Territory government as the environmental minister or something, um, they did a study on the snow. And what that study proved was from the stacks, so all the pollution that's coming out of the stacks in the tar sands, that there was all this like poisonous particles that were landing in the snow and then the snow melts in the spring and goes directly into the water so that's not even treated or anything in that there was a lot of harmful chemicals in that so there have been like studies happening and the communities are, are doing studies but i'll just say this the one thing that the industry has gotten good has been good at is silencing people so they they have the communities gather all this really good information on health the impacts to health, the impacts to animals. You might, you guys might have seen the um, two-headed fish that came out, the, the fish with uh, cancerous sores. If you Google that, um, I think it's a uh, cancerous fish and, and uh, for Chippewan, you'll see Dr. Schindler at that time when they were doing that studies, they found that fish. Um, and, uh, but what the one thing that the industry has gotten good at is they'll part of their working with the community, they'll provide the community the funding to do all of these studies, but they have convinced the community that it's not good to share this information. And so as keepers of the water, that's one of the things we're doing is we've launched a monitoring program. We're doing independent monitoring of the water because the information's not flowing. Either the community's have been led to believe for whatever reason that they can, they shouldn't share this information and the government has a ha, doesn't have a consistent rely, reliable monitoring program so there's a need for an independent monitoring program and an independent health study um and i'm not saying that the communities like we have a a, a, a respectful working relationship with the communities but it's complicated because a lot of these people work for industry, they have agreements with industry. And so, yeah, so I'll just leave it at that. I don't know if that answers your question. I think that was very helpful in understanding there's so much evidence already showing there's health impacts. And yet now they're considering putting more dangerous stuff in there. Daniel, did you wanna add anything related to this healthcare question? No, I think Jesse covered it well. Thank you. Well, I know we only have a few minutes left, but there's at least two questions of the many that are trickling in that stand out. Um, there's one that says, are there any lawsuits currently against oil companies and or the government for collusion and polluting the Athabasca River? Um, and I think all of us have many thoughts there. So I'll ask us to maybe just do a quick round of answers. Um, Jesse, would you like to, to start? Is there anything you'd like to share? Um, the one thing I'll share is that there, there is a First Nation that's currently suing the government of Alberta for cumulative impacts. Um, and I'll just put that, that in the link for you guys. Um, that's Duncan First Nation. So cumulative impacts is a big discussion and it's not something that we're going to shy away from. It's something that an, an issue that we're going to continue highlighting as organizations. What industry likes to do is they want to be seen as a standalone project. So, you know, the company might be like, well, we only cut this much, many trees down and we only, you know, use this much water. And they do not like to be seen as a cumulative impact, but that's the reality. So there's like 19, just in the tar sands area alone, but this is happening all over in the boreal forest without proper consultation. And again, who's consulting the animals on this? Like imagine coming home and your home is gone. Like we just assume that, that they don't have rights either. Um, and so this First Nation is suing for cumulative impacts. And then when I talked about the, comp the, the complex relationship that these communities have in the tar sands, like Fort Mackay, Miccosu, and ACFN, is they have 
um, agreements with these companies, but they have um, intervened. They have they 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 intervened to stop Tech Mine. Tech Mine was because there's a line. It's it's the fire. It's called the fire bag. And the elders said we do not agree to any industrial activity past this line, the 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 fire bag line. And the tech mine was going to pass that mine. So then that's when the commute, the First Nations intervened to stop that from happening. So together with the First Nations and the environmental organizations, keepers of the water intervened, we stopped that mine from going forward. But it's like a virus. They keep coming back and it's just like, it's just so hard to get rid of. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll let Daniel go next. I don't have a lot to add. Um, uh, I'll just throw out something really controversial and ended there, which is that Canadian law has been built over centuries on on really oppressive uh, kind of doctrines like colonialism and patriarchy, and is in a sense has been designed to protect these industries to the detriment of Indigenous nations uh, and their rights. And so, it actually. I'm not an expert on this, and I wasn't even when I when I practiced law. But finding ways to sue a company for things is very difficult uh, because that legal system, when it deals with indigenous peoples and in an indigenous land, has been designed to justify the theft of indigenous land so that a colonial nation can profit from the extraction of minerals and hydrocarbons. That's a, that's a really helpful answer in context, I think, for us when we think about illegal action. Um, and, and to answer your, your question as well on, you know, any current actions being taken, um, I'll share with you that a few years back, Environmental Defense partnered with another organization and with Daniel on putting a submission to an international body called the Commission for Environmental Cooperation saying, hey, we know those tailings are leaking. We know the industry knows, and we think it's a violation of the Fisheries Act. Um, and we submitted this to this international entity who, who looked it through and who did a factual report. And it's a really long factual report that really confirms that indeed the tailings are leaking in the groundwater. And indeed, this goes against what the Fisheries Act is supposed to protect us from. And so just to tell you that, you know, there is that language out there. Um, but no action has been taken since. This federal government has not taken legal action um, to address the fact that um, the, the tailings ponds are operating in violation of the Fisheries Act. Um, so that's another important context and I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, I'll go to our last question, um, but before that I might ask our uh, wonderful folks that are helping us backstage, uh, Maddie and, and Paula, if they wanna link to uh, two calls to action for you. As you might be feeling some of our anger on the issue, maybe you're feeling it too. Um, Keepers of the Water has an action page where you can um, share their letter that really uses uh, their indigenous point of view on the issue and you can amplify that by sharing that. And then um, on our side, we have a letter that really addresses this point about the leaking tailings and how um, we are opposed to release. So sharing with you those two letters that you can uh, send on your own time and, and help us in this movement. Um, and I'll go to the last question, although I see you keep asking more. Um, let's just do that. Um, we have here a question about recycled water and basically saying, um, are your groups and our indigenous groups considering um, recycling the water in the process as one of the solutions to the tailings issue. And I know that's work that Keepers is thinking about. I was reading the questions. Can you repeat that? Yes, absolutely. So the question is, um, you know, uh, this person is suggesting that the production process should recycle or reuse the water instead of releasing it. Is this something that our groups are looking at and what's our, our position and whatnot? Yeah, that's what I already mentioned is that we that's that's our stance. We are opposed to any dumping of any tailings treated or not treated into the Athabasca River. Um, and so it, they don't know how to treat these. It's a huge science experiment and it's a crime that they've been allowed to continue to expand and expand 
based on these proposals, which weren't even proven. So they have to submit environmental assess impact assessments. And in that, and also reclamation plans. So the part of their reclamation plan is that they're gonna reclaim the tailings. Well, they don't even know how to do it. So how have these projects been getting approved to begin with? That's like, how is that even legal? And they don't know how, like, and, and what we've been hearing is that there's companies out there that do know how to treat the tailings, but that it will cost the companies too much money. So they wanna do this the cheapest way and the easiest way for them possible. They don't care about us. They don't care about the First Nations living downstream or the animals or anything impacted. They care about money and it's just, it's uh, really sad. And then I seen a question about water. Um, does it impact the communities in, in uh, Manitoba? All water is connected. And so what we're seeing is the tar sands is spreading into Northern Saskatchewan and the waters flow, so the waters, uh, uh, underground water is connected, fl water is flowing east. And so does it impact your community? Yeah, it impacts your community. Um, maybe not directly from the, the water itself. I believe it's from the water because the elders tell us that all water is connected, but also from the pollution, the air pollution, the acid rain, um, you know, and it, it, we're all connected. We're not, it, what, uh, what happens here affects you over here. We need to start understanding that. Um, so that's, that's how I'll answer that question. That's helpful, thank you. And uh, it's a related question in there, but I saw, and that's, I think it's for Daniel really. Um, someone was asking about uh, Bill C-15, which I believe is the act to implement UNDRIP and how it's related to all this. And, and I thought this might be something you wanna to touch on before we close. Yeah, I think the the question was how that legislation plays into that, and that's legislation of Canada's federal government. Um, and uh, the synopsis is that it it really the only thing it does is require Canada to put a plan in place to make all of its legislation consistent with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So you would imagine that that would apply to the Fisheries Act, but what we've been told by officials from Environment Climate Change Canada is that um, that process of making the Fisheries Act consistent with the UN Declaration is not going to be done before they want to get these regulations in place and begin the release of treated tailings water. So it's like this decision is, in a sense, grandfathered. Um, from from what would happen under that uh, uh, legislation on the UN declaration. Uh, the kind of bigger issue I want to flag, though, is that the, the way Canada has been talking about it, their politicians, and also the way the non-derogation clause is written in that legislation is that it makes it sound like Canada's intention is that they're going to effectively put the UN declaration and the rights in that declaration underneath the existing Canadian constitutional framework, which includes Aboriginal and treaty rights, which is pretty poor. It's pretty pitiful and it's inconsistent with the declaration. So for example, section 35 rights in land claims and, and Supreme Court Canada jurisprudence talks about the duty to consult, but they don't acknowledge free prior and informed consent. So there's a bar there that's not met by existing Section 35 law. Um, and you can't drag the UN Declaration down any further. That's, that is supposed to be the floor. It's a minimum standard. Um, our rights should only go up from there. Uh, so, so the UN Declaration is the floor and Section 35 is like the basement. And that's what Canada is trying to do with the UN Declaration by the way that legislation has been drafted. There's been a lot of people flagging that. A lot of us flagged it during the engagement process when they wrote that legislation and they didn't change it. So we don't have any actual legal test of what that legislation means. And it's not written like other legislation that implements international law or agreements. But the indications are that they're going to try to water down rights around free prior and informed consent and effectively make them meaningless. Thank you. I want <clears> to <throat> thank you all for joining us tonight. And um, 
you know, in the closing part of our uh, decolonizing work that we do uh, as an Indigenous organization is, um, you know, learning our language. That's a big thing. And um, uh, connecting to the land it's called resurgence because it and or you know the doing the things that we've always done so it's not we're not doing new things it's we're, we're returning to our ways the things that we've always done so you know hunting fishing trapping these kinds of things and um um and ceremony prayer is really important you know and so as a as 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 Indigenous people, it's like we, it's not just a, a one track mind of like, this is what we're doing. It's a, it's a part of who we are, you know, and so we have a lot on our shoulders as, as this generation is coming up because we have to keep our languages alive. You know, the languages have, have all become through genocide and through the residential schools that the languages were almost lost. So, you know, we're, we're, we're relearning our languages. Um, you know, we're returning to ceremony. We're returning to the land. A lot of us were raised on the land but we're also building that deeper connection with the land, um, you know, of um, that the water has a spirit. And the one thing that I was taught recently, I want to share with you guys is that everything has a spirit. So the tree has a spirit, the, the beaver has a spirit, the firefly has a spirit, and they're all the same. No, and we have a spirit and our spirit is not bigger than the firefly spirit in the spirit world. So we're not above any of these things. And so, you know, as, as Indigenous people, that's how we move forward in, in our walk in this journey, because we understand that we're just here for a short time, but then we have generations coming up after us, you know, our children and our grandchildren, they say gen seven generations. We think about them and we, we think about what is this, this place going to be like in 50 years, you know, and and we see, we sit at these tables with industry and, and the governments, they're not thinking about stuff like that. They're thinking about these words called values, like values as in money values, <laughs> um, uh, resources, dollars, money, economy, that's their language they speak in. It's just, for us, it's like a, a really a two world views that don't align. You know, and we work with allies like environmental defense and, and other um, allies who understand, like, you know, through these harms of colonization and the residential schools, it didn't only impact Indigenous people, it impacted everybody. We're all hurting. And so what can we do to make things right? And the allies that we have on our board as keepers of the water who are non-Indigenous, what we call an ally is they first acknowledge the harms of colonialism. They acknowledge the harms of genocide and residential schools, and they want to make it right. And how you make it right is you give voice to Indigenous people. You know, you let Indigenous people lead because we have the solutions. It wasn't all lost, you know, and that's what the government wants you to believe as well, is that we know, we know nothing because it was all taken away. That's not true. It's amazing how much knowledge is still there on how to take care of the land and how to take care of the water. You know, and there's so much teachings like these creation stories where we're learning. Uh, we partner with a place called Kanyasa Culture Camps, Kevin Lewis, and, you know, and they're bringing all these teachings back. They're spending time with the elders. We're spending time with the elders to learn these, these teachings. And when you learn them, it gives more meaning in life. And so here we are, all of us, you know, we all have a responsibility. We all have a responsibility to take care of water, to protect what's here. And that's part of reconciliation. And so when people say, well, you know, what's reconciliation? And, and for me, I thought, well, what can I do to be reconciliation? But what the elders taught us is that it's not for us to reconcile. It's for the non-Indigenous people to reconcile. So how can you guys reconcile? You know, and those are questions that sometimes people have is like, how can I help to repair the damage that's been done? Because you're affected by it, I'm affected by it, and our future generations are affected by it. One of the things we say is land back, you know, is like, 
the Indigenous people only have 2% of all of the land in Canada because we were forced into these small plots of land. We're outgrowing them because we're recovering from genocide. So our people are having these babies and we're growing and growing, which we're supposed to do. And so it's like, we need some of this land back. We're not here to like kick people off and like go back to your country. That's not what land back means. It's like, we need we we want you guys to urge the provincial, the municipal, and the federal governments to give the some of these land back to the First Nations. Other ways you can help: sign these letters. Environmental Defense has a letter. Keepers of the Water has a letter. The letter we have it goes to Minister Gibault, and it's basically saying we do not support any dumping of the the tailings into the Athabasca River. And then on a more personal level, we say, well, how can, can people help? Build your relationship with the water, pray for the water. You know, if you're out by a lake or by a river, take time to build your relationship and say a prayer. Even with your glass of water, just understand that water gives life to everything. You know, and be kind to people, like teach our children. And I'm sure you guys are all kind, I don't doubt that, but I see a lot of racism. You know, I'm with, I'm with, um, you know, uh, it's just, it's sickening. It's like sad how people treat people based on the color of their skin. It's like, you guys, like, we're done with that. Like, let's move on as a, as a society. So, you know, there's so many ways that we, we need to move forward together on this land, but it's really about giving in, Indigenous people, not giving, because we're not giving it, but you know, respecting that space and respecting Indigenous people's voices. So as you go to sleep tonight, you know, you know, and you guys are getting ready, because I know some of you, it's late where you are. Take time to think about the water, think about the animals, you know, and think about it's not only us living in this planet. And what the one thing the elder told me we were out in the bush yesterday with some elders is it's us, it's we're all connected. So if that little bug ceases to exist, it, it affects that whole chain of life. So just remember that every we are all connected, you know, and so while you may not think you're you're connected to these issues, you are you are we are all connected. And so let's continue having these conversations and, you know, working together to stop this corruption that's happening and to work to protect water. So I want to thank you all. I send you all, all off with, you know, feelings of peace and joy and hope because there's a lot of hope in what we're doing. And we do believe that, you know, we will protect the water. So hi, hi, Kinana Skompnawa, and we hope to see you guys all soon again. Have a good evening. Thank you. Have a good evening.